We have for the first uh, panel, Dave Tarrant, who is a reporter at the Dallas Morning News. He's been at the Dallas Morning News for 20 years, he says. He's covered everything <laughs> <laughs> from war and peace and everything in between. And with him is Bob Miller, who is assistant city editor the day that the tragedy happened here in Dallas, and Jane Thiel, who was the cops reporter at the Dallas Morning News that day. Take it away. Thank you. And I guess, can everybody hear me? Sure. Yeah? All right. Uh, she said, my name's Dave Tarrant. I'm a reporter at the Dallas Morning News. And both of these men, Bob is still at the Dallas Morning News. Jim was a longtime police reporter at the Dallas Morning News. Uh, under the column Robert Miller, uh, he, he does a column for the Business News. I say he's the most popular guy in Dallas because his phone rings off the hook. Everybody wants to be in his column. Um, but in uh, November of 1963, that weekend, Bob was looking forward to his birthday uh, on November 24th, and little did he know <laughs> how things were going to change. Uh, Jim was, a, of course, a police reporter at that time, and he had gone to meet with, uh, gone to Love Field here in, down, in near downtown Dallas uh, to meet the uh, plane that came over from Fort Worth bringing JFK and and Jackie and, and, and everybody else. And I wondered if you could start the story there, Jim, uh, with uh, the arrival at Fort Worth and seemingly, I guess, nothing much seemed that out of the ordinary and then how things turned for you. The, uh, the assignment that I covered was to be there to see if there was any kind of reaction to the, the president's arrival that might involve the police because I was assigned to police headquarters. And we had other reporters there to get the color and, and carried on from there. And uh, the interesting thing that I found when I got to the airport was it was a light rain, overcast. And I thought, well, this is going to be kind of a damp situation over this. But by the time we got in position for Air Force One coming over from Fort Worth, I, when the Air Force One was spotted, the clouds were parting, sunshine breaking through, and by the time the president and his wife, first lady, were on the ground, it was a beautiful morning, a great morning. And I saw nothing that would involve me that I'd have to report back to the city desk. And uh, the reception that the president and the first lady received there at Love Hill was, you could still see it today because they were, they were so warmly greeted that the Secret Service finally just broke back and let them walk along the pathway of the, of the fence line, shaking hands and everything else. I mean, that close to the president. I mean, and when all this was accomplished and everything else, uh, I had nothing to call in on. Well, back then, we didn't have cell phones. We had to rely on public phones. And that was always a struggle, too, on a major story. But anyway... Uh, I thought, I'm getting ready to go back, back, back to the police headquarters, which is at, up on Upper Commerce Street. The Candy Motorcade took a eastern route to, to come back through downtown going west. And so I took Stimmons going back to downtown. Of course, I was out 30 minutes late getting out of the traffic and everything at Love Hill. What I saw was the Kennedy motorcade now rushing to Parkland Hospital. I had, uh, uh, I was at going uh, southbound and the motorcade was going now, and I knew something was wrong. It just didn't fit, you know, a presidential motorcade, because the lead car was uh, occupied by the Dallas police chief and the Dallas county sheriff. Behind that car was the presidential's motorcade. And that's what I saw this Secret Service agent still hanging on the deck of the, of the car. Uh, he had jumped up there at the scene to keep Mrs. Kennedy from falling out or trying to jump out, one or two. And he was still hanging on the deck of the, of the open, open there limousine. And I knew that, well, that's not right. And, then, and the, there were three buses carrying the White House press car, and they were strung out. And the rest of the convoy on the motorcade was strung out. Now, get this. I had no idea that anybody was going to shoot the president. Nothing like that occurred to me. 
what I thought happened, because I didn't have any other communication, was that the motorcade had run over a pedestrian. Hmm. Because the pedestrians on this side of Stimmons were crossing five lanes this way and five lanes that way to get on the closer side to watch the motorcade. To be as it came in. So that's my thought, really. I thought they'd run over a, a pedestrian. Let me uh, let me hold you right there because at this moment, uh, after the limousine, after the motorcade was supposed to go through Dallas, it was on its way to the trademark. Uh, Bob Miller was again the assistant city heir at the morning news uh, that day, but he was also uh, at the trademark. He was going to hear JFK's speech that morning. Uh, that that noontime at lunch. Tell us a little bit about what the atmosphere was like at the trademark and how you heard the news. I don't know if anybody's familiar with the <clears throat> trademark or these uh, um, buildings down in the, in the di industrial district, but they're atriums. And you have, like this, open-ended, and I was up here on the first level above that, being very important. I was invited to the luncheon, you see. So the, it was in that corner, and we had finished lunch. After all, they had wanted everybody to get that out of the way before, <coughs> pardon me, before uh, the speech began. And uh, someone on my right to this day, I don't remember who it was, but had a little handheld transistor radio. Huh. They did have transistor Transistor radio. radio. Some kind yeah. radio. And... Uh, so that's where the word first came, and we looked down on the first floor, the ground floor, and there was nothing but just consternation everywhere. And so we all headed back to the uh, uh, to, to the Dallas News. I guess the Herald went back to the Herald. I don't know. And uh, <laughs> there were the, two papers in the city at that time. But anyway, the uh, the odd thing about it was by being invited. Uh, to the you know, to the luncheon, which was quite an honor. The thing was, uh, a lot of those reporters and others, it was during the lunch hour after all, they went over and sat down you know, along with the roadway. So they were really closer to history and we important people. Right. <laughs> over, you know, at, at, the, at the trademark. trademark. So, uh, um, after, we, after the... After you heard, you, I guess, did you hear that he had been killed or you heard that there had been shots fired? What exactly did you Basically hear? that uh, there was, he had been you know, shot at. And I think it was later than that, around 1 o'clock or whatever it was, when Walter Cronkite issued the, you know, the, famous, <coughs> the famous words that, uh, that he's dead. And, yeah. uh, but anyway, <clears throat> of course, that was on my, uh, on this, that'd be on Friday. I was... On November the 22nd, on November the 3rd, I mean 20, uh, 24th, my birthday, if anybody's doing any math, I'm going to be 90 in uh, November, November the 20, 24th. And so then we were, uh, of course, it was just mayhem, but everybody just fell into the proper role and began working on it because we, we had a paper coming out the next day. Which, uh, now I've been in this business uh, since 1981. In fact, I was hired on the day Reagan was shot at, so there's some uh, parallel here, I guess. <laughs> um, but uh, to imagine something of that enormity happening and you still have to put a paper out. Mm -hmm. So you went right back to the morning news mm -hmm. and what were you supposed to be doing at that moment? I mean, well, uh, shortly thereafter, we, <clears throat> of course, uh, we had photographers, and uh, we wanted to make sure they were all, you know, not covering the same thing. And in fact, when I heard that a police uh, a policeman had been shot, of course, it was Tippett. Uh, I said, I may have been stupid as it could be, but I said, if it has something to do with the assassination, forget it. You know, you know. It was, uh, you were heading out to the Texas Theater, or Jefferson's still there. <clears throat> and uh, well, I had no idea that it was the same thing. And uh, at that moment, of course, later on, we found out different. Um, thanks, Bob. I want to go back to Jim for a second, because uh, Jim has an interesting story. He was actually at the Texas Theater uh, when Oswald was arrested. Jim, tell us how that happened. 
The good thing about it in, the, in those days, the press had a very smooth relationship with the Dallas Police Department. <laughs> and because of that, I was chauffeured by police. <laughs> uh, at, I went on up to the police department. You know, when I came around the triple underpass, I knew then something had taken place over around this building because everybody was scattered out and running around. And, and in those days, we kind of relied on one of the Dallas radio stations, KLIF, because they covered everything, every little tidbit. They were, they were on top of it. So I switched my radio to them and everything else. And there was a, a police call taker by the name of Dorothy Trempton. And she usually was always a turn off to reporters covering the headquarters beat and everything else. But Dorothy was saying uh, shots had been fired over KLIF. And so I quickly got up to, to the police department, got in the basement. We could park in the basement in those days. And as I was walking up to get into the building where later Jack Ruby shot Lee Harvey Oswald, I met an outcoming police sergeant that used to be a, a Times Air reporter, but he qualified to become a police officer. So. And I asked him, I said, what's going on? He told me, he said, somebody shot Kennedy. And I said, you're, where are you going? Down there. And so there he already had a marked squad car pulled up, Ray. So I just jumped in the back seat, <laughs> got back down there. Then a call comes out that a shot, a, a Dallas officer has been shot in Oak Cliff. Uh, they, I've always said this. I've been around the cops for about 10 years at that time, and I was... It went through my mind. Who is the officer? I left the scene of where the shots had been fired at the president's motorcade, jumped in the back seat of a captain's car, and made my way over to Oak Cliff, and eventually wound up when they decided that the suspect had entered the Texas theater. Now, let me pause here just a minute. To my belief to this day is Lee Harvey Oswald might have escaped detection by doing one thing. When he entered the theater, he didn't buy a ticket. <laughs> so when there was a man, a merchant who was following him was suspicious, went up to the telling booth and said, that man had just went in here, did he buy a ticket? And the teller says, what man? So that told him. Now that's the reason why then the police converged on the Texas theater. Mm. If Oswald had stopped long enough to buy a ticket, he might have been able to pull it off and maybe not kill a Dallas officer later on. You know, what's interesting about this, too, is, is, uh, is in, the, in the shock of what's going on, you know, it's hard to actually comprehend it emotionally. Did you, what was going through your own thoughts? Did you have time to really think, no, oh, my God, what's I had happened? no time to call anybody. I had no way to get into a telephone. Well, earlier, back when they were pressing the hunt, search for the Oswald back towards, uh, I didn't know it was Oswald, but the man, back on the East Jefferson, closer to Marcellus, where it intersects, I did have time to run into a Cabell's Minute Market. They had a competitor with 7-Eleven stores, and I used a public phone there and called in, and I got one of my editors that works with Miller. His name was Harvey Bogan. And I didn't, I wasn't aware that they knew that what I was doing out there. And then when I got to, to Bar Harvey, I said, I need a photographer here in Oak Cliff right quick. We got this blah, blah, blah going on. And his reaction was, you what the hell are you doing in Oak Cliff? Because all the action was at Parkland Hospital from the school book depository, mm -hmm. Parkland, because that's where the president was. And uh, so then we went from there. Uh, I hope you explained to him. <laughs> I really didn't, but uh, I, and I never saw a Dallas News photographer. We were always so prompt in getting on the scene and everything else. But most of our guys, under Miller's probably his direction, were at Parkland Hospital. You know, you makes know. makes sense. Yeah. Um, I'll get back to you in a, in a second on that. But I want to. Uh, okay, so you're starting to get calls. Uh, what's going on there, and when do you actually find out that? Uh, President Kennedy has been killed, and how do you find it out? 
Well, I think uh, we found out by radio, same okay. as because the time lapsed. Right. It was about the time that it would take us to get back over there. But I imagine in, in, in a situation like that, there's so much confusion. And, uh, you know, like he said, there's jockeying to get phones. There's not a lot of time. When you Were you taking phone calls from reporters at that moment? It was part, uh, of, uh, part of the time I was. Part of the time you just knew what to do. I mean, get the photographers over there, you know, mm -hmm. or talk to, let's say, Jim Ewell or the others mm -hmm. to find out what's going on. After all, we, we were getting all our news secondhand, not, you know, right. uh, right. Observance. And but you still got a paper to put out. How do you know exactly what the story is? At, at, you know, and, and how it's going to come together. I mean, what what did it take to, to put to put the story together in the end? Uh, I mean, it, a newspaper's not rocket science, <laughs> and basically you did what you always did, except right. it was a bigger story. Some right. days you have a bigger story than others. Right. This course hadn't happened to be one of the biggest in history. Right. So. Did it ever, did you notice any emotion in the newsroom, or, or did you guys just kind of put that aside for the time? I don't remember thinking anything about, oh, what was us, and yeah. all, all that stuff. Let me then, answer that, Dave. Uh, Dave asked this question a while ago, and I, I skipped around it. All the time I was riding around put chasing with the cops to, 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 to make the, the detection of the, the assailant, I never thought I had my feet on the ground. I had such a feeling you know, of knowing what had already happened, and but I didn't know the president was dead. All I knew was shots had been fired at the motorcade, so I didn't know what the turnout was, other than we were concentrating on getting the assailant for the police officer, J.D. Tippett. And so back to your question, David, I don't think I ever felt like I was doing what I was supposed to be doing that day because things were rushing past us so quickly, I never had time to even pull a pencil out or get my notebook out and make comment to you know, get some quotes or something that had to add to the story. It was moving too fast, and I was so lightheaded with what I thought was going to be one of the, gosh, it was, it was, a, it was a thunderclap. And I just couldn't put it together. I, I thought I was a pretty seasoned newspaper man, but that day I didn't. I didn't match up. I really didn't. Now in the Texas Theater, uh, I went up in the balcony, and they were having a hard time getting the lights up. Then they were screaming. Cops were screaming, "Get the lights up!" Get... So when I get upstairs in the balcony, it gave me a uh, topside view of the arrest of Lee Harvey Oswald sitting right below me. And the officer who made the first contact played it really smart. He came from the back, and Oswald was sitting back there watching all the police officers were coming in the backside around the screen. This officer was Nick McDonald, and he came up the left to your to Oswald's right. He, he came up that uh, that aisle, but he stopped and looked over people that were sitting in the theater all the time watching Oswald. Oswald was watching him, but he pretended that he didn't really know that Oswald was a suspect or that he was a target until he gets right up there on the line. He can certainly dart in and grab Oswald, and that's what he did. Oswald had his 38 revolver out to shoot this officer if it came down to that. And the reason being is that there's still semi-darkness in there, and Oswald thought maybe, you know, he, whatever. So... As he tussled with Nick McDonald, he pulled the trigger. But the officer, I don't know if you read this or not in the past, but he used the web of his hand to stop the action of the hammer going to the bullet. It didn't stop it entirely because it did dent the bullet, the cap. But that, then by that time, other officers were jumping in. Hmm. I'm watching it from up there, and it looks like a football huddle around him, hmm. I think. Now, people, keep in mind, they had, it turned out, the assassin of the president within less than an hour and a half after the shooting. They cost us one officer who had stopped Oswald on the street because probably he, he matched the description. Maybe that. But I was never told precisely from the police or anything else what caused uh, uh, Tippett to stop Oswald. But, uh, and Tibbet had a, 
had a, uh, a tendency as a police officer not to look at you and to straighten the eyes. So when Oswald, he called Oswald over to the car, typically leans across and blows the window down to kind of lean over and talk to him. Really. But for some reason, Tippett wanted to talk to him more out on the street. And as he leaned back over, opened up his door, and stepped out, Oswald stepped across where he could fire across the hood of the, of the squad car, and he dropped Tippett dead right there. But Oswald was seen by people out there with a gun. Really. So let me tell you something. Tippett, to this day, is my national hero. Because without him stopping Oswald, Oswald might have made a clean escape. And who knows what would happen to Dallas that night. Because already Mayor Cabell was getting threats on his life. And Miller, you remember the, they pushed the uh, security, the building security down at the news, moved out on the curbs to start screening incoming people, incoming cars. Because uh, it could have been that the, my, the Dallas News itself could have been a target. Hmm. But then Oswald is arrested and brought downtown. Uh, and uh, thanks. That's, that's very gripping. Uh, and uh, so you get the paper out. <laughs> oh, that. Oh, that. <laughs> oh, that. <laughs> They're still getting the paper out. Uh, you are, I'm going to skip really kind of quickly over parts of the story for time, but uh, yeah. you are the assistant city, actually you're the city editor in charge that Sunday, your birthday. And uh, the only thing going on that day is a routine transfer of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald. Uh, and uh, tell us a little bit about that, where he was going, what, what was supposed to be happening there. And when you find out that things have really not done. gone according to plan. Well, as most of you know already, the, um, the, he, he's up at the police station. And uh, the photographers are there, the reporters are there. And uh, I still believe that Jack Beers, the Dallas News photographer, who had his gun out, I mean, had a picture of him like this. Now, the one that won was Bob Jackson. He was right here earlier. <clears throat> well, he's, he's grabbed him to his side, because that's when the, two seconds later. I, I'll, I'll, uh -huh. I'll just interrupt just for one second. A friend of mine, Mike Granberry, he was here earlier, but uh, he did a story. There was only six tenths of a second between the shot that showed Oswald getting, you know, the gut shot and, and him reacting to it versus Jack Beard's fo photo, which was six tenths of a second earlier, which just showed Oswald like this, but Ruby like that. And it was the difference between a Pulitzer Prize winning photo and, and one that wasn't. But We think that the difference, we at the news, that the flash that went off that... When Beard took the picture, yeah. When Mr. Jackson saw it like this. No, that that day, I mean, after that, <laughs> oh, yeah. Miller's desk calls back. I mean, Miller calls back to, to us up there in the police press room and saying what a great shot we got. He said, it's so good, we're going to put it entirely front page. And, they, and we couldn't believe it. We were so lucky. Miller, remember when Jack Beer shot? You guys already think. And then the word came down late in the afternoon that the hero was holding off something even better. <laughs> um, Hero, I, heroes are made, not born. I, there you go. I, uh, now, before, we only have a few minutes left, but I want to get to the part because, uh, now, were you there? Uh, what was your role that day? Uh, uh, on the day that uh, Oswald was shot? Yeah. Well, I wasn't there. And uh, the desk... Uh, I, I told the desk that night, that Saturday night before I left, that everything was so routine. All they were going to do is bring Oswald out, put him in a, in a car, and transfer him down to the county jail, which is right back here. And that was routine to us up there on the police beat because it's, okay, the only thing that the photographers were down there is because there's photo opportunity to get Oswald being out in front of the cameras. And so I wasn't there. Uh, we did have a 
a Dallas News reporter who happened to be walking into it. And so he was there, and that was Hugh Ainsworth. But uh, when I, we had just moved to our present home, it was 50 years ago today, and uh, uh, my first son had walked in and turned on the Sunday morning television. And they were broadcasting the ceremony in London. Then they cut back to the Dallas Police Headquarters building because here came Oswald out, you know, with this car. And uh, so uh, I was watching this, and all of a sudden, here's this black figure shoots Oswald. And I can't believe what I'm seeing of this. So the only thing I could think about doing was get to a telephone. And Bob Miller was on the desk, and I called Miller, and Miller thinks I'm down there. I wasn't words. going to tell this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't there. <laughs> um, so how did you, did you call Miller eventually? And Oh, yeah, I got, yeah. Miller well, how started, did that conversation he go? He started, uh, well, I don't want to repeat what he said. <laughs> I, yeah, just, you know. I did it one time before, and I really regret I did it. But there was some conversation said and everything else. The only thing I want to do to wrap up is, is uh, I mean, I know you've been asked this on, uh, probably a hundred times over the years, but but uh, how did you get through that weekend? I mean, what, what got you through? Well, his mother, my wife, uh, actually was down there, and she's doing chores. She wasn't even on the payroll, but she's, you know, <laughs> typing this reporter's report stuff and all the others. To be quite candid, I don't remember taking stock of the thing. Gee, we have you know, history, and there goes uh, JFK, now I guess LBJ. You know, you don't think of it that way. It's just one on top of the other, and you get the paper out. Paper went late, I'm sure, because uh, we had accommodations for that. And uh, I don't know who's shooting the picture there. But uh, the thing is, to say this routine doesn't mean, I don't mean to den denigrate the importance of it, what's going on, but you go through the motions you know, that you've been through a million times, and there's always some story bigger than the other. On this one here, of course, uh, they had the transfer of power out at uh, Love Field with LBJ and Jackie and, the, and Air Force One, things like that. But uh, basically, you're doing what you've been trained to do, and not that bigger change. All right. Now, if you want to get into Dallas and all that sort of any, stuff, I can give you a... Any last word, Jim? I'd like to editorialize right now. <laughs> and then we just got a minute. I never thought Dallas was a hate city. Uh-uh. Not seeing the crowd down through Main Street, Love Field, and thereafter the outpouring of the crowd. What Dallas fell into was that we had a nut here by Lee Harvey Oswald, who was a defector to the Russians, to the Soviet Union, brought back a Russian wife. And he is the person that uh, for history will always show right now was the assassin. And he had no connection to any of the political side of Dallas at that time. So I never thought, and I'll tell you what, I think it turned a lot of people when they realized that Oswald's background was Russian. He was a, he was a traitor. And uh, so I never subscribed to it. And I didn't see any evidence of any hate towards Dallas cops. They may have described it when they went out of, out of the city and run into it. But I didn't see any, anything like it around Dallas at all. Well, thank you both. Um, before we bring on our next group of panelists, we'd like to open it up to questions. If anyone has questions for these panelists. Yeah, Bob, today's newsroom has TVs everywhere. Uh, uh, if something happens, you're going to get calls from the field instantly by cell phone. Uh, what was it like then in terms of the layout of it? Oh, and, and if, if a disaster happens, one editor becomes sort of in charge of the logistics and making sure how everything works. How did it work back then? I mean, were there, were there TVs up in the newsroom? Did you have radios, uh, 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 police radio or other kinds of radios? Yeah. And then just logistically, uh, who was in charge? Once, all right, the word came in that there was the shooting. How, how did the newsroom, how did the editors organize the coverage? Well, 
it was uh, probably a nanosecond between the time that you hear about it and the fact that everybody else, all the editors, sure, they weren't on duty, but God sees they heard it. The city editor, John King, comes down. Jack Kruger, I can't remember what his managing editor, executive editor at that time, he came down. I mean, the whole compliment, everybody knew what they were, you know, nobody's going to stay at home with something like that going on. So <laughs> there we were. And uh, did we have help? Yes, of course, we had help from all of them, and uh, up and down the chain. And uh, I was not the lone hero, you know, holding back the water of time. Before no, there were no TV sets in the newsroom. There was not even a police squawk box. We had the squawk box in the police press room. And we knew you know, instantly when things was going on by the signals and everything they were putting out. But you can guarantee after that happened, the Dallas News installed a police dispatch radio in the newsroom. So they could pick up on the calls and everything else. And I don't know if it's still up there or not, though, Bob, but it was I, when I you were still not hang around would the you, Dallas police station. <laughs> would you have uh, dictated your story? Did you have time? I mean, did you have to just sit down and start writing it? What, uh, I mean, no, how, what were the mechanics no, of that? No, we, we did a little bit like they do it today, and then they run it into a rewrite setup. Okay. But uh, on the day of uh, the Oswald shooting, uh, there's another city desk reporter up there with me, Hugh Ainsworth, and we called it in notes as we grabbed it because we didn't have time to slow down and try to get to a top our, our press room was already overtaken by all the outside media. Anyway, we, we were blocked out. So we had to call in and guess who was taking the notes? His wife. <laughs> <laughs> and then so she, of course, family. turned it over to... It's a family to, newspaper. Yeah, they, she turned it over to other writers there in the newsroom who put it all together for the, for the next edition. That's interesting. Yeah. Any more questions? One more question, if I could. Uh, there, You touched on the whole city of hate thing. And, Bob, I think I, was, I told you I, I might ask you this question about, you know, was, was Dallas a severe right-wing city at that time, or you had to, you know, as a daily newspaper, you were covering the events before the assassination. Uh, is there something to that, that well, idea? Well, our congressman, I don't know <clears throat> whether you're familiar with, but Bruce Alger, he was a Republican. He was a right-wing Republican, as we know him today. Probably if it was such thing as the Tea Party, <laughs> he would have epitomized that. And... Uh, so in those days, the, the, all of Dallas County was one congressional district. So whether you were here or not, Troy was decided by the business community. They, they pretty much ran things. They were known as the oligarchy, in fact, by those who came in from out of town, the reporters. So what happened was Earl Cavill stepped down, and he ran against Bruce Alger. And he beat him. And now J. Eric Johnson whom I happen to believe is probably the best mayor we've ever had. Uh, he wasn't elected the first time he took office. He was anointed. The business community marched down, and they... And this asked, is after the assassination, right? After yeah. the assassination. Yeah. They asked him, you know, to, uh, uh, to take over the city. And uh, he complied. And, uh, and, of course, Bruce Alger was beaten by, uh, by Earl Cavill, whose name is on the side of the federal building. And uh, off you go. I mean, I always felt that the city was, I mean, definitely not involved in the shooting one way or another, in any way, but that they acted as though they were. And that's what, that was the engine of change that uh, changed everything. To this I do recall just before the president's visit that the Dallas police, were, through their, their sources and intelligence and this, picked up on a, a planned by a group coming out of Denton to our north northeast, I guess. And they would come and stage an incident in the parade route to embarrass the president. And uh, we never reported it either because it was just that kind of situation. The police uh, sent some plainclothesmen up to this group and told them, said, you're not going to be com coming to Dallas at all. And put it down so pat to them that they knew that they could not come to Dallas and be unmolested. <laughs> they, they got the warning. And they, so that quelled that right quick. I guess. But it was interesting to look back, uh, as people looked back at Dallas 
immediately in the aftermath of the assassination, they would say things like, well, look what happened to Adlai Stevenson. Look what happened you know, when, when the woman uh, protester had, had a sign and hit him over the head. Look what happened to LBJ and, and so forth. And there began to emerge a narrative about Dallas. Yeah, yeah. How, did you, uh, how did you react to that as a citizen and as a newsman? Well, the incident involving the, uh, the woman with a picket striking the Adlai Stevenson, the version is probably known as that she did it intentionally. There was way her to show her anger towards, you know, the, the Democratic Party or whatever you want to have it. But I was always told by the police who were around that scene, I think, from that day on and everything else, that she was up there trying to get the picket in his face and everything else, and she was bumped from behind. Another person bumped into her, and this was the accident. And she comped the, the UN ambassador on the head. And I think that was probably called by some news photographers or Bob or whatever, you know. And that's the way it came out, that she was, she deliberately hit the ambassador. But the town was very conservative in those days. And uh, as I say, if you, not just the, like the Republican Party exists today, but pretty much like the Tea Party exists. And uh, they wanted to make sure that Bruce Alger, who had his yard stick, you know, is it justified? And if it isn't, then he turned down, you know, the, the money for Dallas County. And so what had happened? Well, it didn't stop in Washington, and some other county got it. And that was the, uh, the way of looking at politics in those days. And I mean, or today, you know, you, if we're not taking money from the state. I don't want to, oh, I'm not going to get politics. But, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we may not want to go too deep into that. But thank you all. It was a great panel. Um, <laughs> Uh, before we bring on our second set of panelists, these pictures are uh, real pictures of uh, James Ewell then and now. I told Bob that we couldn't find a picture of him then, and he said, I've always looked like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our second grouping of panelists also have stories about the JFK assassination and where they were on that day. And again, it goes to our mission of telling stories, perhaps of people who've never heard their stories told before. We've got a quite a, a eclectic group of panelists. Diane Solis is our uh, interviewer for this panel. She's a reporter at the Dallas Morning News for 16 years. She's been a foreign correspondent in Mexico, and she now covers immigration issues. Uh, we have Albert Valtierra. Uh, he is president of the Dallas Mexican American Historical League. He was 15 years old when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. He was a Vietnam vet and served as a sergeant in the Air Force. Rosemary Hinojosa is the sister of Albert Valtierra. She was 12 years old and in seventh grade at Gabe Allen Elementary in West Dallas when the assassination occurred. Um, she is now a counselor at Methodist Children's Home. And she was the first Mexican-American congressional intern from Dallas in 1972. We also have Brenda Spencer Robertson. She is head librarian at the University of North Texas in Dallas. Um, she considers herself somewhat of a family historian, and she was in fifth grade at J.N. Irvin Elementary in Highland Hills when the JFK was assassinated. Diane. Well, thank you all for coming. Brenda, why don't you take us back to that day, November 22nd, and tell us what it was like to be a 10-year-old and what happened in your classroom when, when a teacher brought in this gadget called a television set. Well, in 1963, I was 10 years old and a typical 10-year-old. Uh, the only thing that really stands out in my mind about our school is how the family values were mirrored with the teachers. We had a wonderful set of teachers at James Nelson Irvin it's E-R-B-I-N, Irvin Elementary School. It was a school that went from the first grade through the 12th. The entire school was made of portables. That meant portable buildings attached on one side, on the other side, and connected with a wooden hallway so you could hear every step. And this is what happened on that day. It was a normal day. I'm in the classroom. My position is 
near the back because my last name began with S, and I can see the door on my right, and I can see when my teacher is bringing the television set in. It was the style back in the day where it was a tall stand, and the black and white set was perched on the top so that anyone seating could look up and see. That day, I learned just today talking to Mrs. Mamie Brooks. She was my fifth grade teacher. I talked to her on the way here to clarify my memories. All the time, I thought she prepared us with the television first, and we watched things as they happened. Today, she reminded, she said, no, that's not what happened. Mr. Perkins, the math teacher, was running down that wooden hallway, yelling, the president has been shot. We were such a close family knit type of environment that the teachers all converged. She ran and got the television then. And that's when I saw her bring it in and we started to witness the things that have been repeated over and over in my mind. All I know is that we were children who were quintessential patriots. We sang the Yellow Rose of Texas, Texas Our Texas, and the last line in the Pledge of Allegiance Liberty and justice for all meant all. And President Kennedy coming to Dallas was a big deal. Do you remember actually seeing the, the television showing the horrible scene of... My of, memory and jumps to the teachers crying. And when the teachers cried, the students cried. We mirrored them. We waited to see what do we do now. Uh, I honestly have blacked out the visual of the actual motorcade incident. And I'm sure I only know of that because I've seen it a hundred times since then. Mm -hmm. But what we did was cry. And the teachers, the school, school was not let out. What they tried to do was continue the lesson and they would leave the room to gather themselves, come back in, start to cry again, and we cried again. And this is what Ms. Brooks confirmed with me today, that that entire day, all the teachers just cried, and the students cried. Okay, all right. Albert, you were a 15-year-old at Crozier Tech High School, and you were a photography buff, and the, the teacher or, uh, or the whole high school let you folks out to watch the downtown parade of the Kennedys, right? That is correct. And tell us a little bit about what it was like for you. Well, uh, as you say, we, uh, I was in a photography class, and uh, yes, they let us out of school. Our school is uh, uh, located at uh, Pearl and Bryan. The back side of it is on Live Oak. Uh, so they let us out, uh, excused us uh, to go and uh, see the uh, motorcade pass by in the parade route. And uh, so I, I, I was at the corner of uh, Harwood and Live Oak, and I was on the passenger side, and uh, because I was in the photography class, I was, I was able to take this bulky camera that I don't even know what we call them, you know, uh, photographer buffs may, and I took a, uh, a picture as a motorcade passed by, and I was, uh, I, I think there might be a, a picture of it uh, here, but I think uh, I must have been within feet of, uh, of uh, President Kennedy. And, uh, but I wasn't looking at President Kennedy. I was looking at that beautiful woman <laughs> sitting next to him. I was a 15-year-old boy, and 15-year-old boys, you know, are thinking about girls. And by gosh, she was beautiful. And we made eye contact. I, I truly feel like <laughs> I, and, and when we made eye contact, I knew she loved me. <laughs> I knew that she did. And uh, um, so, uh, I mean, that was just a, a, a flash in time, just a, mo a moment that just the, the motorcade went on. They, we went back to school and, uh, you know, we, I immediately got in our photo room and uh, processing room, uh, processed the film and uh, printed the photo. And then within minutes after that, we heard the news that uh, our president 
had been shot and killed. Yeah. So, yeah. For African Americans and for Mexican Americans, uh, John, uh, John Kennedy and Jackie Kennedy ha held a special perch. Can Can you tell us a little bit uh, about why that was so? Well, for uh, for our family, our Mexican American family, uh, we were especially. Um, I guess cognizant of the fact that President Kennedy came from an immigrant family and we were from an immigrant family. And uh, Jackie Kennedy spoke Spanish and we spoke Spanish. And uh, they were young and so that appealed to us. But I think the most important thing for our family is that they were Catholic and we were Catholic. And so uh, Albert and I talk and we've talked uh, as a panel group how on our family walls of our home, we had a picture of uh, the Pope, and a picture of the Virgin Mary, and a picture of John F. Kennedy. He was that revered in the Catholic uh, Mexican-American culture. And so that, uh, to, to me, uh, he exuded a lot of hope and optimism, and I was just going into my teenage years, so I was very hopeful and optimistic that this president, uh, you know, would do something for us and would stay true to some of the things that, that he had promised, uh, as far as civil rights, uh, uh, fair housing, uh, and he worked, uh, also with Cesar Chavez, who was the United Farm Workers Association, uh, leader. And so we also had been migrants. And so a lot of that, uh, to me, we recognized, uh, and I think that's why we love President Kennedy so much. Okay. And we paid cl very close attention to uh, President Kennedy because he had a young family. Mm -hmm. He had children. I'm thinking, I'm in my, tw my 10 year old mind again. And I was fascinated to see any picture that I could ever find of the children and, and little John and, and Caroline. But I didn't know you had that picture. We ha in the black families, you'd see Jesus, John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and Robert. That's I don't know who published those, but they're probably rich. They have, yeah, they're covering all the all the rounds. But uh, the one thing that I could say historically, we paid a lot of attention to what our religious leaders had to say, and our educators because most of our population were uh, domestic workers or not in the, the parts of the business that ran the city. You depended on people who had their finger on the pulse to tell you what to think and what to do. And so the educators were saying, tell your parents to vote for Kennedy. And the preachers in the churches were, were guiding gently and sometimes not so gently on which way to go. So when we heard that Kennedy cared about what we cared about, didn't matter if he was Catholic. We, in our own culture, we have Baptist and my best friend, I, I was uh, Disciples of Christ. My best friend was Baptist. The other uh, neighbor around the corner was Jehovah's Witness for me. And uh, then there was Methodist and uh, a Catholic church around the corner. Religion was secondary. He cared about what we cared about. Okay, all right, thank you. Back in that time, uh, there were even Viva Kennedy clubs back in 1960. And Albert, could you tell us a little bit about this whole phenomenon of the Viva Kennedy Clubs and and whether or not they actually delivered the vote? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, keep in mind that I'm 15 years old, so I'm not really politically astute at this time. I'm, I'm hearing some things. Uh, uh, and I've talked to friends and family. And the Viva Kennedy Clubs were an offshoot or a uh, direct result of um, a military organization, Hispanic military organization, called the American GI Forum. And so what these, this organization uh, did is uh, they formed a, uh, uh, a political uh, action committee, if you may, uh, before that, was, that term was even uh, discovered uh, or talked about. And so uh, the... Uh, the, the Viva Kennedy clubs were um, politicking for John F. Kennedy in the during his 1960 election, and uh, what we what we've discovered is that um, 
During the election, John F. Kennedy uh, carried 91% of the Mexican-American vote in Texas. Wow. Uh, I mean, that's, that's, you know, short of Goldwater, that's probably as uh, close of a runaway as you can get there. Um, but, you know, and, and uh, there's this story that uh, we've heard as uh, the, these Viva Kennedy clubs and uh, the American GI forums um, gathered around, um, they were under surveillance from the FBI uh, because they were considered subversive. And the reason they were considered subversive is uh, the FBI was uh, researching and spying, if you may, on this, uh, on this organization. And so as they went into um, their locations, they, they would uh, uh, go through their papers. And there was, uh, in, in our language, uh, we use the word quite a bit, uh, comadre and compadre. And that's, uh, that's like a godmother, godfather. And as the FBI was reading these uh, papers, they associated that as saying comrade, yeah. and comrade they associated with uh, the Russians, which means that this was a subversive organization. So they, they spied on them uh, continuously. So uh, uh, Really ironic, because this was a group of veterans who had sacrificed mm -hmm. for the country. That's absolutely correct. You know, they'd gone yeah. off to war, and uh, here they were, the FBI was thinking that they were... Uh, working to overthrow the government when they had supported the government. Mm. Okay. Okay. Brenda, back in that day, can you tell us a, a bit about what it was like for black families here in Dallas? Well, in the 60s, as I was saying, a uh, majority of our, if you were not an educator, the uh, majority of our adults were working as domestics. My mother was uh, Luis. Brini Spencer was a domestic worker, and I do have a story of, about an experience that I had with her. I wasn't in the habit of going with her to work, but on this particular day, and I, now that I think about it, she took me with her because after she finished the job, we were supposed to go and shop with the money she earned. And we went to a person's home to, for her to clean it, and I was typical, mouthy, 13-year-old uh, at the time, and I wasn't helping. I was in the way. But I saw my mom change the linen, mop the floors, wash the dishes, clean the bathrooms, and everything else, and dust. And when we were leaving, she was paid $6. And you know, every family has a one child that says things that they can get away with that the other kids <laughs> wouldn't. And I said, I will always go to school. I will never do that. And instead of being upset with me, she just answered, looked at me and said, I hope you don't have to. The good part, the end of that story, that was the last time that she did that. And the next thing over the course of the years after the assassination and, and desegregation, desegregation started to happen, she applied for a job at Texas Instruments. My mother brought home a solder board to practice for the, for the application. She had to use a soldering iron and connect the line of solder on a circuit board. I watched her so nervously try to get it perfected so that she could get that job, and she did. She retired from Texas Instruments. Wow. Okay, uh, Albert, can you tell us a, a little bit what was Dallas like uh, that day after after the the shooting had happened? What did the mood feel like for you, a, a 15 year old who was very into the whole fact that the Kennedys had honored the city by coming through in a motorcade? Well, we were um, as I went back to school. You know, everybody was pumped up. You know, they let everybody out of school. We're two blocks away from the motorcade, and uh, we went back to school, and everybody's really buzzing about it. And then all of a sudden, you know, we start hearing the news that the president's been shot. I'm not sure if we heard that he'd been killed, but we heard he'd been shot. And uh, 
all of a sudden the, the mood at the school uh, became somber. Um, mm. and then we heard our principal announce over the loudspeaker that uh, they were letting us out of school for the remainder of the day. And uh, so uh, we, during the uh, parade route, it was a sunny, clear day. And then, again, keep in mind, Crozier Tech High School is downtown Dallas. And uh, uh, we, were, we were catching the city bus to go to school and then go back to our home in West Dallas. So they let us out of school, and we have to walk about eight or ten blocks to the, to the bus stop where we catch our bus. And as I walk down there, it just seems like everything is getting darker. And it's, uh, the mood just has changed. And uh, as we get to the, to the bus stop where we are, it just seems like all of downtown is dark now. And it's like it's cloudy and gloomy. And I've thought back about that day. Uh, I'm not sure that maybe it wasn't that the stores were closing that day, uh, so there's less light coming from the inside the stores. But it's just real somber, dark. Nobody's talking. Lots of people are crying. Even even some of us that were this age, we were crying. We get on the bus. People are crying on the bus. And we get home and, you know, we still have a little bit of walk to go from the bus stop where we get dropped off to the house. And it's just, uh, it was just a real, real sad, sad mm -hmm. afternoon, evening, and the whole weekend. Okay. And as the days progressed, many of you, um, many people in the U.S., I understand, began to write sympathy letters to, to Jackie and I'm Jackie Kennedy, and I'm very impressed by the way Jackie Kennedy seemed to touch all of you. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Rosemary, you even penned a, a sympathy mm -hmm. letter yourself. And you have it with us. Could you I read finally it? found it. <laughs> I had lost it. And I think a lot of it had to do uh, with the fact that we were seeing, once we got home from school, we were seeing television 24-7. And I, th I think that was like the advent of 24-7 media coverage. And so it, it, it touched us even more, you know, j just the trauma of it all. So I wrote a letter. I never mailed it because I didn't know at 12 years old where to send it. I didn't know you could just say the White House and it would get there. Uh, but I, so I kept it. Uh, I said, Dear Jacqueline, my name is Rosemary Vantiera and I, and I am 12 years old and in the seventh grade. I live in Dallas. I've been wanting to write you a letter, but I didn't know the address. I am sorry it will come late. It never came. Uh, I just want to tell you that I am very sorry about the death of your husband, the former President John F. Kennedy, and that I weep with you as all the nation does. I think of him many countless hours of the day and I also think of the dreams I used to have that someday I would meet you or see him. And that dream almost came true. But on November 22nd, when he came to Dallas, I could not go because I had to go to school. But when I heard of his death, I prayed that God would take care of him and that he go to heaven. But secretly I knew that he had gone to heaven because he was such a wonderful man. When I saw everything from beginning to end on television, I wept. I don't expect you to write back, but if you aren't busy and wouldn't mind, I would so appreciate just a little note from you so I could treasure it the rest of my life and then pass it on to my children if I have some. Thank you. Sincerely yours, Rosemary Valtierra. Oh, gosh. It's still emotional, as you can tell. I, I couldn't believe uh, I did a video for the for the morning news, and, and they asked me to read it, and I couldn't believe that I started getting emotional because it still gets emotional. After 50 years, as a little kid, I guess, uh, I, I just remember when we heard in school that he had been uh, killed, and then I don't remember anything else until I got home and started watching TV, so the rest of the day was blank. So. Absolutely. Okay. Fifty years have passed, and many people are assessing what if. 
what if he had lived? Mm -hmm. well, and, and also, what was his legacy? And as as um, Mexican Americans and African Americans, many have touched on the civil rights mm -hmm. legislation that passed. Could you folks talk about about what you think was a was accomplished and how significant it was? Well, I, I think that. Uh, uh, President Kennedy's uh, uh, expectations for the country and for the future helped us as Mexican Americans to become more politically active, more politically involved and participatory in our in our country in our system. Uh, so, for a young person like me and Albert, I think it. Uh, I, well, I can't speak for Albert, but for me, it helped me to to see what I could do, because I remember what President Kennedy said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. And so for me, in my own small little way, uh, if I had wanted to be a US Congresswoman, but that didn't happen, but I did get to be a congressional intern. Uh, but in, in my small way, I became a teacher, and I gave back to my community in that way. I uh, tutored kids, I mentored kids while I was in college, and so uh, that was my way of participating in the civic uh, affairs of our, of our uh, city. Thank you for mentioning that, Rosemary, um, that the, his statement, ask not what you can do, what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, the part that resonated with me was the ask not what your country can do for you, and I remember I don't think I told anyone. I said, oh, I, don't, I will never be on welfare. <laughs> I just didn't want to ask for anything. Mm -hmm. But in ninth grade, you know, after the 63, 64, and through 68, and we lost to Martin Luther King, and then in, from uh, April to June, we lost to Robert <coughs> Kennedy. We, I, I, I entered the first integrated school in ninth grade, Bowed Story. And it became real. Things started to mean a lot more then. I knew what everything was. The puzzle pieces started to fit. At first, growing up from 10 to 15, it was still kind of, what just go to school, get your grades, hope you go to college. But when I started to go to an integrated school and I realized, oh, this is different, or that's different. That was not at our portable school. Uh, we didn't have, oh, look what they have in PE. Look, they have chemical labs. <laughs> Things started to resonate. So, yes, wow. it continued. Okay. And, Albert, uh, at, in 1960, you, of course, couldn't vote yet, but the poll tax still existed. By the time, um, by the time you were 18, did the poll tax end? I'm not sure when the poll tax ended, but uh, I know that here, locally here in town, there were big marches. Uh, I know that uh, one of our uh, community community leaders, Pancho Medrano, uh, um, you know, worked with the black community to get the uh, poll tax uh, outlawed. I'm not exactly sure what that time frame was, but uh, yeah, that that was uh, uh, that's not unlike the uh, voter ID law. But we won't go into that discussion. <laughs> And do you think that the minority community's voice has been heard much in in uh, that time uh, of the assassination? Uh, there was no, no. There was no real reason, I don't think, at the time to even consider going directly to a minority community and asking, how has the assassination impacted you? Uh, we were too busy living and trying to figure out what to do next. And yet, with us, uh, the Mexican-Americans, given President Kennedy 91% of the vote in Texas, 83% across the country, you would think mm. that uh, the media would have come and asked us, uh, you know, same thing with Clinton and with Obama, we've given them about 71% of the vote, and we still don't seem to be on the radar uh, yet in that respect. Okay, Albert? Oh, I agree. Uh, it's, uh, um, I mean, you can even go back to 1960, the research that I've done, uh, the Viva Kennedy clubs uh, supported uh, John F. Kennedy and uh, did, with the intent of 
some appointments and some support uh, for our community, and it really wasn't delivered uh, during his three years in uh, in office. So um, there was some pushback from the Mexican American community to uh, to John F. Kennedy, and it, it, even today you see the the, the voting pattern today. Um, there's not enough representation for Mexican Americans or any people of color, quite honestly. Mm -hmm. been a great panel. Um, we'd like to open it up to questions. Anybody from the audience, I'll bring the microphone to you. I do just want to make a comment regarding the Mexican American and minority communities being on the radar. I think we are seeing today that, uh, that there's organizations and, and political parties that are saying, oh, maybe we better start trying to uh, to um, accommodate this group or work with these groups, and uh, they're important to us being in our positions. Thank you. Yeah, as far as uh, uh, media representation of what was going on at the time, were there, was there an African-American newspaper in Dallas at that time? Were there, were there Hispanic, Mexican-American publications at that time that, that covered the way the community was responding to the, the assassination? I would say yes, because there were African-American papers, and I hesitate to call the names because I'm not sure when one started. I know the Examiner is a very old paper, but I don't know if that was the name of it then. Uh, yes, we did have our inner community papers that... Uh, do you remember how, how they covered the event? I, I'm sorry, I do not. Uh, the Times-Herald was what we subscribed to. And for us, the Mexican-American community, we did have El Sol de Texas, but uh, it, to me it was more for the, for the primarily Spanish speakers, uh, Mexicans rather than Mexican-Americans. We read the Dallas Times Herald and Dallas Morning News. And Arnes, if I can add one, one point to that, because it just reminded me, and I think the panel right before us spoke to it, and that's... Uh, this reference about the city of hate. Right. And uh, um, I agree with the gentleman that spoke earlier that, you know, in Dallas and in the parade route and all the things that I've heard and seen, we all love the president. Um, however, in 63, uh, you know, I joined the, the military, uh, or the military asked me or told me to join them. <laughs> and uh, so I. Uh, at, when you're in the military, the first thing people ask you is, where are you from? First thing. I mean, you know, besides your name. And when I would tell them that I was from Dallas, it's, uh -huh. and this was four years later, five years later. So it's still in, the, uh, in their conscience there. And uh, they, they would say, ah, you're the guys that killed the Kennedy. I mean, killed the president. You know, and we had to face that, you know, for a long period of time just because we were Dallasites. Do any of you have uh, similar stories? I had a personal one, but I have a better one now. <laughs> I had a cousin who was just moving to Dallas that school year from Henderson, Texas. And before he came, his family, grandparents, mother, everybody was cautioning him about, you're going to a big city. Be careful of the people. Don't listen to anyone and just protect yourself and be careful of the people, the students, you know, don't get into fights. And he said he was in Dallas three weeks and the president was killed. And he was devastated about where he had moved from and to because then in his mind, Dallas did it. Uh, when I was 15, I was in California and a teenager said, oh, Dallas killed the president. And I thought, I didn't kill the president. And I was, it was hard for me, and still is hard for me, to how a stigma for an entire city gets labeled for an incident. Was Oswald even born in Texas? No. He wasn't born in Dallas. But Dallas killed the president. That's the nation, the national label. Any other questions? Any final thoughts from our panelists? Thank you. Uh, Just uh, thank, you for, thank you for for allowing us to tell our story. Thank you very much. And, and I appreciate you, it. The only, 
the, the final thing that I would add is um, it, it's good that this uh, conversation is being uh, had here in Dallas. Uh, people say, you know, don't talk about it anymore, don't. Mm. But for us, as we, we talked the other evening, we thought, you know what, I think this might be the first time that they've asked our perspective. And when I say our perspective, you know, Mexican-Americans or African-Americans, uh, people of color, they, they, they're, they're finally asking us, you know, what were y'all thinking? You know, so we appreciate the uh, opportunity to let you know what we were thinking. Well, thank you for joining thank you. us. Thank you all.